on World News Tonight. Shocking revelations. Declassified documents reveal it may not just be Afghanistan connected to the 9-11 terror attacks. Nuclear mayhem. North Korea is back to blasting away as the country continues on with explosive threats. Passport Passover. The United Kingdom prepares to roll back special powers connected to the jab passes. Traversing space. SpaceX passengers prepare for the flight of their life on a journey out of this world. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the war of terror waged by the United States since 2001. After declassified FBI document related to Saudi hijackers responsible for the 9-11 attacks was released for the first time, U.S. officials say that it doesn't prove that the Saudi government was complicit to the plot. A declassified FBI document related to logistical support provided to two of the Saudi hijackers who took part in the 9-11 terrorist attacks does not offer evidence that the Saudi government is complicit in the plot. That's what U.S. media agencies said after the 16-page document was released on the 20th anniversary of the attacks, following an order by Joe Biden to declassify and release the information. Six months ago, President Biden ordered the Department of Justice and other related agencies to conduct a declassification review and reveal the document. He was under pressure from the families of 9-11 victims who have long waited for the report while they pursue a lawsuit in New York alleging that the Saudi government supported the hijackers. The Saudi government has always denied any involvement in the attacks. However, allegations of Saudi's complicity have long been the subject of dispute in the U.S. Fifteen of the 19 terrorists who hijacked four planes on September 11, 2001, were Saudi nationals. Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan reaffirmed Sunday that Saudi Arabia welcomes the decision by the U.S. to release this document, adding that it would completely show that there was no Saudi involvement in the attacks. Iran and the IAEA have reached a last-minute deal to allow inspectors to service the UN agency's surveillance equipment after Tehran restricted access earlier this year. In a joint statement, the two sides agreed to work closely together. Talks between Tehran and other world powers over the Iran nuclear deal may be at a standstill, but a compromise agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency has offered a glimmer of hope. At the heart of the deal, the UN watchdog surveillance of Iran's nuclear sites. On a visit to Tehran, the IAEA's director general held the new pact. Since December, Iran had blocked access to cameras at their nuclear sites, a move that the IAEA had argued is detrimental to its monitoring work. This while Iran continued to ramp up its uranium stockpile. The IAEA may have claimed a small victory Sunday, but the footage taken at the site since December will remain in Tehran's hands. Iran has said it will only give access to the tapes once the U.S. lifts sanctions. But the head of Iran's nuclear agency has offered some concessions. The issue over surveillance may be partially resolved, but the future of the Iran nuclear deal still hangs in the balance. Talks between the IAEA and Tehran are set to continue in Vienna next month. A matter of days after North Korea held a scaled-down military parade in Pyongyang, North Korea this morning announced to the world that it test-fired long-range cruise missiles during the weekend. These launches come some six months after its last such provocation. The regime's state-run media claims Kim Jong-un was not present during the launch. The Pentagon has reportedly broken its silence on North Korea's test launches of a long-range cruise missile amidst stalled denuclearization talks with the U.S. Citing a release by the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, the AFP reported Monday that the U.S. criticized the North's missile tests, saying they are a threat to neighboring countries and the international community. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency reported the test firings took place Saturday and Sunday and hit targets 1,000 kilometers away, proving the new strategic weapon's effectiveness and practicality. 
It reported the missiles traveled for 7,580 seconds along oval and pattern 8 flight orbits in the air above its territorial land and waters. The missiles flew successfully using propulsion power generated by the newly created turbine blast engine and passed technical indicators with flying colors, which included detailed tests of missile parts, scores of engine ground thrust tests, various test flights, control and guidance tests, and warhead power tests. The test firings took place without leader Kim Jong-un present. Instead, senior military official and presidium member of the North Politburo of the ruling Workers' Party, Park jong chun watched the launch. According to the KCNA, Park said the missiles are another great manifestation of the tremendous capabilities of the North's defense science and technology and the munitions industry. He stressed the need for the field of national defense science to go all out to increase defense capabilities, the war deterrence of the country, and to keep making achievements in meeting the grand and long-term targets of securing war deterrence. Details of the recent launch were not revealed by South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. The South Korean military is in close consultation with the U.S. in analyzing the recent test fire. The recent launches came after North Korea held a scaled-down military parade last Thursday to mark the 73rd state founding anniversary. The test firings of cruise missiles, which unlike ballistic missiles, are not a violation of United Nations sanctions and appear to be a demonstration of the regime's military power through low-level provocations. This is the fourth provocation by North Korea this year. The North fired cruise missiles right after Biden's inauguration as U.S. president on January 22nd, as well as on March 21st. It fired ballistic missiles on March 25th. Major amounts of constant rainfall has brought upon a serious flooding on Godavari River, causing many of the displaced and some even feared missing as the area is slowly getting swallowed up in the floods. Let's cross over to other than a world news pressure correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting now from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri? Yes, Shenali. Incessant heavy rains in western India led to flooding of Godavari River of holy town of Nashik, posing problems to local and pilgrims. Temples at riverbanks and idols were seen submerged in water as people took to bathing in temple compounds as water entered some high-level areas too. One 45-year-old is feared swept away in the flash floods in the district. The city received 37.5 mm of rainfall uh, in Saturday night. The precipitation slowed in intensity since then but has not stopped. The water level at Gangapur Dam re reached to its 97% uh, capacity forcing authorities to discharge water. Annual rainfall is essential in India as rain supports two-thirds of its 1.3 billion population living in the rural areas who rely on farming. But excessive rainfalls cause problems like floods, landslides and waterborne diseases. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Pressure Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. People fled their homes in six more Adalusian towns and villages as fire crew in Spain worked to contain blazes raging close to a resort popular to British tourists and retirees. Firefighters battled a raging wildfire in the mountainous Sierra Bermeja in southern Spain on Sunday as the country sent in a military unit to help tackle blazes burning close to a Costa del Sol resort. The wildfire, fanned by strong winds, has now driven out close to 2,000 people and killed one emergency worker since it erupted on Wednesday. Huge plumes of smoke rising above the mountains could be seen from miles away. Footage released by emergency services showed firefighters trying to contain the flames in the dry wooded terrain amid high late summer temperatures. Evacuees, some elderly, sat around plastic tables in a sports center in the nearby town of Ronda as volunteers brought in bottled water, chairs and supplies. It was very quick. They rushed us out. I came only with the clothes on my back and left everything there, even the animals, a dog and some cats, though I don't think anything will happen to them. I thought it was never going to happen, but there was such a big cloud over the village that it was scary. The fire has covered roughly 15,000 acres, according to provisional data. The Regional Forest Fire Agency said 365 firefighters were tackling the blaze, supported by 41 aircraft and 25 vehicles. 
Regional Environment Chief Carmen Crespo said on Friday that the blaze appeared to have been started deliberately and investigators were working to uncover more details. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Pope Francis met with the anti-migration Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban behind closed doors at the start of a brief visit to Budapest, where he also celebrated a mass. One has stood in solidarity with migrants, while the other, a staunch nationalist who opposes multiculturalism. During a visit to Hungary, Pope Francis's meeting with Prime Minister Viktor Orban was a brief one. Unlike other papal visits, it took place behind closed doors. Speaking on the encounter later on Facebook, the leader said he asked the Pope not to let Christian Hungary perish. Orban has often portrayed himself as a defender of Christian Europe, an identity he believes is under threat by Muslim immigration. His government has also enacted what they call pro-family Christian policies. In July, Orban's administration came under fierce criticism for adopting a law that critics say bans the promotion of homosexuality. Pope Francis has condemned nationalism and populism. After meeting with the head of state, the Pope visited local Christian and Jewish leaders, where he defended Hungary's 100,000-strong Jewish community. The Pope's short visit to Hungary concluded with a mass at Hero Square in the capital. His next stop, Slovakia, where he'll stay for three days. Protesters marched in Paris for the ninth straight weekend condemning France's government mandates health pass, which is now required for a majority of social activities. For further details on this, we now cross over to other than a world news pressure correspondent, Chetana Dharmaratna, reporting now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. The French government requires a health pass for people to enter cinemas, restaurants, gyms or museums. The pass shows proof of vaccination, a negative test or recovery from the disease. People on the march chanted slogans such as freedom and Macron, we don't want your pass. The protesters say they are hoping the government withdraw the health pass and especially that they don't make vaccinations mandatory. The government says it is necessary to combat the pandemic. Violent clashes broke out another protest in Toulouse when an unidentified group attacked demonstrators with sticks and walking crutches. The Interior Minister said 121,000 people joined anti-health pass protests around France. Back to Chanel. Thank you. That was at the Therena World News Pressure Correspondent Chetan and Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will set out his plans tomorrow to manage the COVID-19 pandemic into winter months, announcing a decision to scrap the introduction of vaccine passports. The British government's abandoned plans to introduce so-called COVID passports in England and will take steps to end some of its emergency powers that were enacted to fight the pandemic. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will formally set out on Tuesday his plans to manage the crisis in the winter months. Johnson's under fire from some in his Conservative Party for raising taxes to fix a health and social care crisis. Health Minister Sajid Javid said on Sunday that he did not anticipate more lockdowns and that the COVID vaccine passports would not be introduced in England. Under the plan, people would have had to use the passes to prove their vaccination status to enter some venues such as nightclubs. The government will depend instead on vaccines and testing to defend the public. Javid also told the BBC he was not, quote, anticipating any more lockdowns but would not take the measure off the table and that he wanted to end PCR tests for travellers as soon as possible. The Nighttime Industries Association trade body, which represents the nightlife business, welcomed the U-turn. Britain has one of the highest official COVID-19 death tolls in the world, but its vaccination rate is also high. Latest government figures show 80% of adults have had two vaccine doses. Over in the United States, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy said that President Joe Biden will announce new actions to combat COVID-19 before the U.N. General Assembly meets. I'll be announcing additional steps to help the rest of the world later this month. U.S. President Joe Biden will announce new steps to slow the spread of COVID-19 
before the U.N. General Assembly meets on Tuesday. That's according to Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, who said on CNN Sunday, quote, there will be more actions that we continue to work on, especially on the global front. Murthy did not specify what those actions would be. He also defended Biden's efforts to expand the vaccination effort in the United States. We also know this virus transcends borders. Biden on Thursday said he would require federal workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and mandate that large employers either require their workers to be vaccinated or get tested regularly. Biden also said the United States had donated 140 million vaccine doses to more than 90 other countries. More than all other countries combined, including Europe, China and Russia combined. That's American leadership on a global stage. And that's just the beginning. The next session of the General Assembly opens Tuesday. The first day of general debate will be the following week. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Vietnamese authorities warned of the risk of floods and landslides triggered by the tropical storm. Heavy rain brought by the storm killed one person, damaged 31 houses and flooded more than 1,000 hectares of rice fields in central Vietnam. The southern Syrian city of Dara, where conflict had escalated between government forces and rebel fighters since late July, appeared to slowly return to normalcy after a Russian-mediated ceasefire agreement took effect. Israel carried out airstrikes in Gaza Strip in response to Palestinian rocket fire into its territory for a third consecutive night. The Israeli army said that a rocket was intercepted by the Israeli anti-missile system and no casualties were reported. The Taliban's education minister said Afghan female students can attend higher education institutions and universities but in gender-separated classes while explaining the administration's latest education policies during an interview. The majority of the interviewed citizens in the capital of Guinea have been supportive of the recent military coup. The capital city has been presenting scenes of jubilation since President Alpha Conde was ousted, with people cheering for the overthrow of the corrupt government. Peruvians commemorated the 29th anniversary of the capture of rebel leader Abimal Guzman two days after the imprisonment of founder of the Shining Party group died, age 86. The demonstration was concentrated on a park in Lima. Soon, holding up your phone to capture special moments may be a thing of the past. Now you can just look at it while wearing the newly revealed smart glasses created by social media giant Facebook. All eyes are now on the new glasses which claims to have excellent recording capabilities. Mark Zuckerberg and his team at Facebook are the latest tech company to try to make video glasses go mainstream. The social media giant Thursday unveiled what it calls Ray-Ban Stories. Its first pair of smart glasses, which allows wearers to capture photos and short videos, of course, to easily post on Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Users can also listen to music and podcasts, as well as take calls. Zuckerberg touted his push toward virtual and augmented reality in a slickly produced Facebook video. Ray-Ban stories are an important step towards a future when phones are no longer a central part of our lives. And you won't have to choose between interacting with the device or interacting with the world around you. Facebook is treading where another Silicon Valley giant has gone and failed. Google set off a privacy firestorm when it launched Google Glass in 2013. The public was so off-put by the video recording frames that early adopters were called glass holes. The product was abandoned in 2015. In an attempt to avoid that, Facebook has teamed up with Ray-Ban to make its model look less geeky and address privacy measures by including an LED light that appears when the glasses are recording. Facebook, which has faced its own barrage of criticism over privacy and user data, said it would not access the media used by its smart glasses customers without their consent, and the $299 glasses would be an, quote, ads-free experience. And finally tonight, yet another billionaire entrepreneur is set to ride into space this week, strapped inside a capsule of SpaceX rocket ship. As part of an astrotourism team poised to make history as the first all-civilian crew launched into Earth orbit. 
Three, two, one. SpaceX Here. is expected to launch another billionaire into space on Wednesday in what will become the first time ever that humans are blasted into Earth's orbit with only civilians aboard. The group of four is being led by Jared Isaacman, the chief executive of an e-commerce company called Shift4 Payments. Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin have also recently blasted civilian tourists into space, but both of those were suborbital, meaning they don't circle the Earth and only lasted a few minutes. This new trip will take three days and circle the Earth every 90 minutes. Isaacman says they'll conduct experiments and is using the event to raise support for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. One of his fellow crew members, Haley Arsenault, is a physician's assistant at the institution. The other two members are Sean Proctor, a geoscientist, and Chris Sembroski, a U.S. Air Force vet and engineer. They were the winners of an online contest and sweepstakes, respectively. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.